So what do you do for your day job outside of the reserve gig? It's hard to explain, but I, I own an astronaut rescue company. First of our kind, you know, I, I worked for NASA for a number of years developing the astronaut rescue program that the military uses. We basically have our own rescue wing, man. We've got C-130 helicopters, really? got freaking SOV-3 parachutes, got night vision goggles. Most people listening will never know we exist unless there's something that's gone wrong and then we'll be on CNN and Fox yeah. News and everywhere else. And the reason I remember that date, because I'm driving in, all of a sudden I see this launch, it's the coolest thing I've ever seen, and all of a sudden the damn thing does a spiral and then blows up. In our community, in the, in the PJ community, we live by the motto that others may live. And it's not that, you know, that some may live if you're a part of this company. Yeah. So that's yeah. kind of why. It's, some may live if your checkbook's deep enough. Some may Pockets live if enough. you fly with us. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. He spent 10 years on active duty as an Air Force Pararescue, or PJ, and the last 12 years in the reserves doing the same thing. He's done deployments to Iraq, Afghanistan, and the Horn of Africa. Uh, he has done work with and helped out the Special Operations Warrior Foundation, uh, which is taking care of family members of those left behind, specifically with the children. He rescues the rescuers. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Brandon Doherty. Thank you, Mike. It's thanks. great to be on. Yeah, thanks for coming. I uh, appreciate you taking time out of your schedule, especially still still being in the reserves and balancing that whole thing. I know you're busy, and uh, we appreciate you taking the time to come on. Um, what's the last full book that you read? If I'm being honest, uh, I'm not a big reader. Um, I would say, um, I would say, <laughs> not trying to get all, all preachy on you, but it's been the Bible, man. That's yeah. that's kind of something. And I don't know if you've had other guests. I'm sure you've had other oh, guests yeah. to give that as a you know number one Sunday school yeah. answer, right? The Bible. Yeah. Uh, I'm currently reading a book. Uh, it is finished, and uh, that book I'm I'm almost through. It's just kind of leading up to like the cross and stuff, and it's special to me because um, it, you know it kind of shows a currency that I think you and I both understand, which is sacrifice. And so uh, it's just been really cool for me, but. Uh, other than that, you know, a lot of the books I read are just, um, you know, instruction manuals and stuff like that. Other than if I find myself reading, I, I do listen a lot of podcasts and stuff yeah. like that. Uh, what version of the Bible do you read? Yeah, good question. I read the ESV. Um, I just, uh, I don't know if you saw in my bio there, but I actually have a master's degree in Christian ministry. Really? And so, yeah, not that the ESV is like some special version or something, but, uh, as I was going through school and studying, I just found that, you know, like word for word, thought for thought, it was just, uh, to me, it seemed a little more accurate. It yeah. took in some more information and, uh, it's just something that, you know, uh, translates easily to my brain. Yeah. That makes sense. I know there's there are a lot of versions out there. Um, some of them seem to uh, differ quite drastically. Sure. You know, but uh, do you have a favorite quote? Favorite quote, man, that's a great question. Um, yeah, actually, um, so it's Craig Rochelle, and he says uh, people would rather follow somebody who's always real than somebody who's always right, and that that means yeah. a lot to me because uh, I've my whole life I've been surrounded by a lot of fake ass people. Yeah. So in the military? Well, oh yeah, that's like, <laughs> <laughs> come on, man. in the, well, yeah. in the military and, uh, in, in around, I mean, I, I would tell you not in my community, not, yeah. not in the special ops community, but, yeah. uh, in the military for, you know, they're not ex excluded yeah. from well, that. Well, and the higher up you go, the worse it gets. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if time travel were possible, where and when would you go? Oh, wow, man. Uh, time travel, uh, good, yeah, let, let me think. So, um, you know, I'd, I'd love to go back to the 40s, man. Like, uh, you know, I, I think about this last 100 years or, or so and just how much things have changed. And I, I, I've read a lot about the 40s and the World War II era and just the way people were and the way they acted. I would love to go back there and just you know, shake a man's hand and see what the man of the forties was about, yeah. uh, versus the man of the 2020s. Right? Yeah, no, I dig it. I, I mean, it's the great, uh, greatest generation for a reason, right? Yeah. Uh, what is your EDC? EDC. 
your everyday carry? Like what? Uh, what oh, you, what gotcha. You? Yeah. Good, good. <laughs> Another good one. Um, you know, uh, well, it depends on if I'm walking the dog. I just have, you know, I just have my, my little Smith and Wesson, uh, bodyguard, little 380. I throw in my pocket, but typically I will, uh, you know, I'll carry, I'll carry a Glock and, yeah. and just, you know, Glock 19 is just freaking bulletproof. Yeah. Um, I was, uh, let me see, I, I've carried various weapons, but that, that's probably, or firearms, that, that, that's probably the one that I would uh, probably strap to my hip and uh, not be afraid to pull yeah. out if I needed to. No, I, I don't disagree with you there. Maybe on the 380, I, uh, I like the 43X for the small, small really? concealed. Yeah, I do. It, it, uh, you can put a small light on it, like the TLR6, and, uh, and you still can rock, especially with, uh, I don't remember the name of the brand, uh, but you can get 15-round magazines for it which are a total bitch to load, by the way. I can really only get 13 in there, but it's still 13 solid 9 mil yeah. federal HST or gold dot rounds is pretty tough to beat. What, what's in your pockets right now? Can I ask you that? Yeah, I got nothing in my nothing? pockets because I just flew in, man. Yeah, zero. But uh, I got zero in yeah. my pockets. I even took my phone out and put it in my backpack. So If you were at home walking out the door, what would be in them? It would be that little pistol I was talking about. Uh, I'd have a pocket knife. Um uh and then i got this <laughs> people make fun of me man they, you know i got the dad fanny pack it's actually a lulu lemon uh, a friend of mine oh, gave yeah? it to me yeah right. and in in that fanny pack you know i'll have my wallet my keys my phone yeah. uh my badge to get into the airport and all that kind of stuff yeah, so that's good stuff yeah I, I do the same thing uh on a normal day in town what does the the first three hours of your day look like what time do you get up in the in the three subsequent hours so I got two kids at home and they get to school around eight o'clock. So what I will typically do is I'll get up somewhere around five, five thirty. And I usually start by hitting the coffee pot before I even go take a piss, man. I go up and I hit the coffee pot and then I get it brewing and then uh, take care of my morning routine and I go and drink some coffee. I'll break out, you know, the Bible. I'll do a little devotion in the morning um, and then I'll spend about 45 minutes doing that. And then I'll go right across the street to the gym, uh, hit the gym for anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour. Um, I don't usually make it too long and then I'll come home and just in time to grab the kids, uh, you know, kiss my wife and take them to school and then head to work. That's yeah. a pretty typical day for me. How old are they? Uh, well, my son is 11 and my daughter is turning 13 in about six days. Those are some good times. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, what is work for you as a reservist? Well, so I am the senior enlisted leader for the 920th operations group. So in my group in the Air Force, you'll have a squadron and then you'll have a group and then you'll have a wing. And a wing typically has, you know, 2,000, 2,500 people. A group will typically have about 600 people. And then the squadrons, you know, 100, 150. So I, I'm the senior enlisted dude for the group. And in my group, we have the helicopters, we have the C-130s, we got the PJs, and then we have a support squadron. So uh, typically what I will do is a lot of the senior enlisted enlisted stuff that everybody hates, man. Go around, you know, uh, handing out awards and <laughs> taking photos, uh, trying to pump up the, the the troops. But I spend a lot of my time behind closed doors with my boss, basically just trying to advocate for the units, man. And like my goal, and this is, I, I told everybody on the staff there, my goal is to work for the squadrons, not be some funnel that they got to get through to get to the next level. Like I want to work for them, take stuff off their plate so they could do their job and go to war. Yeah. And so anything I could do to reduce red tape off of, you know, what they care about, uh, that that's what I'm fighting for. Yeah. Well, I wish more guys in your position uh, took, took that serious. It seems like most of them twilight tour it and fuck off and, and whatever but um where are you stationed uh, patrick space force base they just changed the name space force yeah. base in in florida coco beach oh, no not sure. a not a bad place to be well, stationed at man little ron john surf shop huh? yeah, yeah yeah um hey guys i know some people bitch about the ads you don't like them uh so we're offering for five bucks a month uh early and ad free episodes of the mic drop show also including uh, some bonus footage that's not in the episode that's published on YouTube or any of the audio channels of the guests and I either dicking around in the studio or continuing the conversation of stuff that uh, kind of is required to be behind a pay paywall, etc. Uh, so go on Patreon uh, for mic drop, five bucks a month, early episodes, ad-free, and bonus footage.
What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. So what do you do for your day job outside of the reserve gig? It's hard to explain, but I, I own an astronaut rescue company. And uh, first of our kind. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I worked for NASA for a number of years um, developing the astronaut rescue program that the military uses. I was part of an organization that kind of bridged the gap between NASA and the Department of Defense to figure all this stuff out. And then, um, and then I started my company about, uh, about three years ago and started doing it for the private sector. So, you know, for the government astronauts, the Air Force PJs will go and they'll load up in C-17s and get all the special equipment and they'll station a couple places throughout the world to go and get them if something goes off target. Uh, but there's nobody to do that for the commercial passengers. So mm. because I helped develop the plan, you know, like the the, the non-government dudes. So since I helped develop that plan, um, started a company, and I just fell into uh, all the right people and all the right resources to be able to do this, where we basically have our own rescue wing, man. We've got C-130 helicopters, really? got freaking SOV-3 parachutes, got night vision goggles, got narcotics and all the different, you know, space equipment. And you name it, man. I got a full, it, I mean, you go in, it's like a full team. We got a full team room. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's like going into uh, just a PJ unit. You come to my, come to my shop. You had me at narcotics. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I can't imagine that there's a, a ton of competition in that space, or is there? I mean, no, 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 no. We, uh, yeah, we, we, we started it uh, to fill the gap because the industry was screaming that there's no solution for this, um, and they had been screaming for several years. And uh, be, you know, I was actually, I was actually going through school, getting my MBA. I didn't have a plan like, oh, I'm going to go work for NASA and then I'm going to take that and go start my own company, making money. That was never in the cards, but it just became apparent. Uh, you know, I worked there for six years in my in my normal job when I wasn't a reservist as a government civilian. And, um, you know, everybody was asking the question, but nobody had the balls to go and actually step out there. And I was getting my MBA. And so I figured as a beta test, as my capstone project for my MBA, I was going to go and, and, you know, see um, – if, if this was going to be viable and uh, do like a, you know, just do a beta test and come to find out, man, it was like, it was an overwhelming need for it. And not just an overwhelming need, but like, yeah, we want that. And uh, we need it within a year. And oh, by the way, it took me and a, and a team three years to build it for the military. So how was I going to meet this need within one year? Well, it was going to take a, film, a, a few million bucks and a bunch of people that are, you know, all in on this, quit their day jobs and just, hey, push them all in and, you know, we're, we're, we're going to go do this, which was hard yeah. to, to jump into business. Um, but because I had 16 years vested, I bought back my active duty time. So I had 16 years as a government civilian, mm. you know, higher level GS. And uh, all of a sudden I was going to literally just quit my job. And oh, by the way, my wife didn't work and I got two kids. I was going to quit my job and go all, you know, full in on this business. So yeah. it's been a wild ride the last wow. couple of years. No, I, I would imagine. I mean, is it safe to categorize your company in that regard as a privatized coast guard for space space travel slash rescue absolutely yeah and in fact uh, speaking of coast guard that's one of the things that we're hoping in the future it hopes not a strategy but we we have a plan to offer our services to the state and the federal government because i mean c-130s and helicopters that are hoist equipped and pjs and we have doctors on staff we got all this stuff like why are we not helping out with natural disasters and cruise ship rescues? And what yeah. if an airliner goes in the drink? Like we got a team that literally could be on them yeah. and this capability, nobody's thinking about it because this capability has never really existed outside the military, but it's a, it's a pretty, um, it's an open aperture. And so we can go after it. We just haven't, you know, we, we got to strategize and 
we're, we're a new company. So yeah. we're, we're, we're yeah. just trying to figure out what we're actually capable of and what we can do. But, uh, but right now the world's our playground and we can just kind of, you know, go and, and, uh, play. Yeah. Uh, what's the name of the company? Operator solutions. I feel like we should have put that in the intro if, uh, if I'm being honest. But, <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's yeah. fine. Man. Uh, operator solutions, uh, I guess from a, from a volume standpoint, um, I mean, how many civilian flights into technical outer space are, are occurring each year ballpark? Do you know? Well, yeah, right now, civilian flights only, um, there has only been, um, there's been three Axiom missions that have gone to the International Space Station, and then there's been one privatized uh, SpaceX only, uh, and that was Inspiration4, when um when uh, it, that was the first one that happened they just went around the earth four or five times or not four or five times uh, for four or five days you go around the earth every 90 minutes actually when, when you're in outer space oh, wow. but uh yeah so uh and it's you know and you're moving fast and covering a lot of areas so if something goes wrong anywhere along that path that's where we come get you it's a couple thousand miles you anything goes wrong along that flight path until you get into orbit, you're going to land, you know, 500,000 miles out in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. And so that's kind of where we come in. But, um, so there's been the inspiration flight, which we did not support, but we did support, um, axiom one, two, and three. And then, um, and we have, uh, you know, a couple other clients in the hopper to, to go and do this stuff. Now we don't support like blue origin and some of these other companies, we do, we do have an agreement with Blue Origin when they start launching Orbital, but like all the suborbital stuff just going up and coming down, we haven't supported any of that stuff. I don't know if we ever will. If there's a need for it, we will. But right now, we are um, kind of going narrow and deep on folks that are going into outer space, going orbital, and need you know a, a team of, of guys that will parachute in and on their worst day if they land 500 miles out in the middle of the ocean. And right now, going straight up and down, there's not a lot of uh, need for that. Yeah, straight up and down, narrow and deep. That's, uh, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, as far as actually being used, I mean, I assume, or, or if you can kind of walk through the, the process of when one of these flights is going to take place and they have you on the ready five or whatever it is like can you walk us through that process from from the time they say hey we need your services to to when it's done yeah so um from when a company says they need our services and right now it's really only been axiom has been the only show in town right so uh, axiom was one of the first movers well I, I take this back we did also support a company called space perspectives and uh, they have a stratospheric balloon and they are covering a lot of area, but we went and recovered their balloon 150 miles out in the Gulf and all their hardware. And they're getting ready to launch uh, people here next year. So we, we, we have supported other folks that are non-orbital, but typically what will happen is we get all the agreements in place. Um, and then um, we will 90 days out is when we really start uh, you know, putting, putting pen to paper, developing a whole rescue plan. It's usually about 30, 40 pages long of everything about the rocket and the crew and, and, and our team, our capabilities and our, our matrix, our, you know, risk management, mitigation, all that stuff. We'll start putting all those products together about 90 days out, um, start staffing our team. Our team will ramp up to about anywhere from 40, sometimes as much as 60 people wow. from a full op center to, you know, the folks flying the planes to the folks jumping out to the folks in the helicopter. Um, and, and then, you know, then we have, uh, some other supporting entities on boats and stuff like that as well, actually in the water. And so pretty big team. So we will typically 90 days out, we will do, uh, training specific for our, our PJs that we bring in. And this is where it really benefits me to be a reservist. Cause there's all these reservists out there. It's probably the same. I, is there, is there reserve seals as well? There is. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you got all these dudes that are highly capable, highly trained millions of dollars poured into their training. And when they're not working, you know, in the military, what are they doing, man? They're firefighters or bus, you know, bus drivers, probably not, but you know, or they're overseas, you know, in, in, you know, in the shit. Right. So we, created this company so that we can employ those sort of folks that are highly skilled and, and maybe even recently retired or, you know, even some active duty guys that are on leave. So we'll, we'll provide some training to these guys. Uh, and, um, and we'll train specifically with the customer, which in this case has been, um, the Axiom folks, which actually 
you know, they, they purchase a ride on SpaceX. We have an agreement with SpaceX. We'll take their capsule and we'll do a bunch of training on the spacesuits, on uh, extracting them from the capsule, all the hazards that are associated with it. There's a, And this is what makes it different why the Coast Guard can't really just sit alert for this because there's all these hypergalls, which they use for fuel on the rockets, um, and it's uh, very toxic if you're not wearing PPE and you don't have detectors to actually detect it, right? So monomethylhydrazine, nit- nitrogen, texoxide, um, and there's other chemicals as well that if you breathe them in, it will, you know, it'll kill you. So um, we teach our guys how to have the right detectors, how to use those, how to use the SCBA systems, how to set up all the nat- uh, the uh, spacecraft-specific GSE, ground support equipment, um, we have very specific stuff that we hook to the capsules and all that stuff. So we'll teach them all of that, how to use all that stuff. And, um, and, and that's typically, it's, it's really not as long as you think it, it it's three days for us. But when I was doing it in the military, it was two weeks. How yeah. ironic, right? Private yeah. industry is a lot more efficient. So yeah. we, we, we do it in about three days. Uh, we teach them specifics on, um, on uh, space medicine uh, somebody who's been exposed to microgravity is different than you or i walking around their neural vestibular systems off like if you you can give them some medication that will you know make their blood pressure drop immediately whereas you and i could could receive it you know there's just some differences to somebody who's been in space so we teach them all that stuff we have doctors come in and teach them all that and then um and then we just start prepping the equipment we have uh <laughs> this is what's great about it's not just operators that come in and work. It's all the support entities, the parachute riggers, uh, life support technicians, all of those folks will come in and we'll pay them really well to build up all these packages that we have, uh, logistics folks, build up everything, get it all ready to go. And then um, typically we'll do all of our readiness reviews and a bunch of paperwork and boring stuff and safety stuff. And then uh, typically three days before the launch, everybody will come in the c-130s will come in load masters will come in start loading all the equipment checking all the equipment doing all their ji you know uh, joint airlift and inspections all of that stuff we go through all of our mandatory briefings by the way we have um adopted all of the military checklists i mean you know there's a lot of stuff in those checklists that were written in blood right and so we we will literally do has decks just like as if you're flying and you're dropping stuff on a normal c-130 in the military we'll do all of that stuff and that's mainly for insurance purposes because if something goes wrong we have something to fall back on and say well why were you doing it this way well we're doing it this way because this is the way the military does it and there's a long history of why they do it this way and there's a long reason why why we have a checklist for this and this and this and and there's nobody else out there that's really doing this stuff. So we'll run all those checklists and then, um, and then we will, you know, give the guys the alert criteria and, uh, we'll put them on alert just, uh, you know, the, uh, four hours before the actual launch, put them on alert, make sure all the forces are out in the field. We actually have a, a boat that's right offshore anytime uh, there's a launch. And that's cause if something happens right on the pad, um, like the uh, rocket explodes, the capsule will actually blast off and will land just right offshore. But the entire range uh, around that area will shut down for about 25 minutes because of all the falling debris. Well, if you don't have somebody right there to get them when they land in the water, there could, you know, they could have medical issues. There's a lot that could go wrong there. So we have a boat actually out in the water. By the way, the military doesn't do it that way. Our company kind of built that TTP, TTP, uh, to meet the need of, uh, you know, the range being shut down for 25 minutes. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, we have folks out in the water and then, uh, guys are on alert. They're ready to go. We haven't had to execute on any of this stuff yet. Yeah. And I know that's a, a question probably in people's minds are like, well, how many astronauts need to be rescued? Like most people listening will never know we exist, uh, unless there's something that's gone wrong. And then we'll yeah. be on CNN and Fox yeah. news and everywhere else, you know, but like, I'll have, uh, you know, family members or, you know, di- distant relatives like, oh, I saw you on TV pulling them out of the capsule. Yeah. Like, no, man, if you ever see me on TV, something's it's gone problem. terribly wrong. Yeah. And uh, that that's, yeah. So most of the time, uh, folks will never know we exist. We're, we're uh, um, I don't want to use the word expensive, but I'll use it because it's the only thing I can think of. We're an expensive insurance policy. Sure. And, uh, you know, if something goes wrong, then we're, we're there. Yeah. Um, I assume the, the length of the mission, so to speak, is going to vary depending on how long they're up there. Like, are you guys staying on station just like until they come back down or if, if they're up there for 
you know, excuse my ignorance. I don't like, I don't know on the civilian side, do they spend days up there or, or not? Or yeah, are you kind of on standby that entire time? Are the guys in the water running shifts? Like, how does that work? Now, that's a great question, Mike. So as soon as they launch and they get more than, let's say, two minutes um, down, you know, down, down the flight path, which is, you know, several hundred miles, uh, we're outside the distance of the boat. So we do have a pretty kick-ass boat out there. Uh, it, can, it has a range of about 300 miles, uh, which we would airdrop in or come in by helicopter if we were that far out. But uh, it, once it gets outside that range of where the boat could even respond, about 150 out, 150 back, then that boat's off alert. And then, uh, you know, they come in. And uh, once they actually get into orbit, we reduce our alert uh, posture to they're not actually sitting in the airplane. They don't have parachutes on or any of that stuff. Like at that point, they're in orbit. They're kind of safe. They're going around the earth every nine minutes. And if they have to come back, they'll come back to one of the targeted sites. And then we're allowed to release our folks. Uh, and we put them in like a ready posture where they got to be back in, uh, I believe it's, um, I believe it's a 60 minute alert, uh, basically cell phone alert. And they got to be in the local area, no drinking, you know, that kind of stuff until they dock with the space station. Once they dock with the space station, now we reduce our alert even further. And now they're on cell phone alert. They can, you know, they, we, we give them more liberty, but we ask them not to leave the local area. And then we say that they need to be back within um, 12 hours, right? Gotcha. Uh, 12, 12 to 24 hours. Uh, they're going to be up on the station for the commercial folks right now. They're going to be up there anywhere from 10 to 14 days. And, uh, and then we ramp back up our alert posture, um, when they undock and then obviously when they're getting ready to reenter. So we kind of do the same thing in reverse minus the boat. Yeah. Uh, and then we also don't have a helicopter for return at this point. Now I would say, um, at this point, we really kind of do what the customer is comfortable with. Of course, we recommend, you know, hey, the full Cadillac version of this. We, we can have alert posture in this way. We can have forces uh, staged here, here, and here. Uh, but if the client says uh, we're okay with this level of coverage, you know, um, seven dudes on a C-130 with all the equipment that can get this far, okay, then 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 that's what we're sitting alert for. So that's kind of how it goes on the um, for the NASA missions uh, for the DoD right now. What they do is they do a similar thing where they, you know, they do training uh, just in time ahead. And like I said, it's usually about a week to two weeks of training. Um, and then that team will be on alert. Um, roughly that whole window is typically about 30 days of like, um, you know, training and then getting on alert and then, uh, and then kind of sitting alert for launch. And then the other folks that are at the station, they do a handover and the other folks come down. And I don't remember what that timeline is, but it's similar. And the reason I say that is because, um, Right now, you know, with like active duty has a deployed to dwell of one to five. If they're supporting 30 days uh, NASA mission, that takes them out of the fight for five months. Mm. And that's why uh, that's an that's one of the big reasons why uh, our company is uh, we have plans to eventually uh, take some of that burden off of the DOD and be able to provide that service because our folks, you know, PJs by nature, were not created to rescue um, astronauts stateside. They were created to go fight the war overseas and go rescue fighter pilots deep behind enemy lines, right? So um, every day that we're taking them out of the fight over there is is uh, is, is not what our taxpayer dollars have been doing, yeah. paying to, to support. And by the way, it's not like the PJs out there are pissed about our company doing this stuff, man. They're like, dude, that gives me a roadmap to you know, go be part of something else. And oh, by the way, make a few bucks. And sure. that's, uh, it's one of the cool things about the company because, um, you know, I lost a really good friend of mine, uh, contracting overseas, a guy named Nick, Nick McCaskill. I think Jason Sweet, when he was on here, talked about Nick. He was actually like a mentor of mine. He had a similar path. We were at the same unit. He went to the reserves and then talked me into it, pulled me over. And then he was doing a, a, a deployment um, with a three letter agency and got shot in the face over there. And, um, you know, my wife's crying with his wife and all this stuff. So it was like an emotional thing. And I always thought, man, if I could provide a way for dudes like us to make money as if they're contracting overseas, but do it stateside, uh, I'm all about it. And that, and that's what we do, man. We, we try to take care of our folks and we actually, 
You know, you come support us, get the same money like you're, you're like contracting overseas, but at night you get to come home and watch your kid's soccer game and, yeah. and tuck your kids in at night and kiss your wife. Like, it's a pretty kick-ass compromise. And, yeah. and to my knowledge, I, I don't know of a lot of other gigs that are like that for folks in our community. Yeah, I, I think it's awesome, man. That's really cool. Uh, but if you guys are anything like me, you know, uh, trouble sleeping can be uh, something that, you know, affects how, how well – the next day is and how productive you are. Uh, if you are having trouble sleeping, I've been working with this company called Dream. And if poor sleep is negatively impacting your life, I encourage you to check them out. It's Beam's Dream Powder. It's a science-backed hot cocoa for sleep. And uh, if you know anything about me and the things that I talk about on this show, you know that uh, sleep is a huge thing and Dream has been a game changer. Um, you know, one, one of the biggest components to the sleep regimen and, and the morning routine that I have is incorporating this uh, Beam Dream Coke, uh, dream Powder, which uh, this, this hot cocoa is phenomenal. Um, today, the listeners get a special discount on Beam's Dream Powder. It's a science-backed hot cocoa for sleep with no added sugar. Better sleep has never tasted better. Um, it's one of my favorite things to uh, wind the day down with. They've got chocolate, peanut butter, cinnamon cocoa. There's 15 calories, no sugar. Uh, it's high high quality efficacy and formulated to ease your body into rest, support all four stages of the sleep cycle, and help you fall asleep faster and stay asleep longer. Um, a lot of other sleep aids have next day grog in this dream. Uh, it's got an all natural blend of reishi, uh, magnesium, L theanine, uh, apigen, and, and melatonin to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed. It's easy to add to the nighttime routine. Just mix uh, the powder into hot water or milk, froth it, and enjoy before you go to bed. If you want to try Dream Beam's best-selling dream powder, get up to 40% off for a limited time when you go to shopbeam.com slash mic drop and use the code mic drop at checkout. That's beam, B-E-A-M dot com slash mic drop and use the code mic drop for up to 40% off. You guys know I talk about sleep a lot and recovery. Uh, magnesium is a big part of sleep, uh, but it's not only sleep that being deficient in magnesium uh, you know, can, can cause problems with. An estimated 75% of all adults in the United States are deficient in magnesium, and it's not just sleep. Uh, it can be digestion, it can be cognition, it can be energy, it can be recovery. Uh, magnesium is a vital component to our body's process. And with that, I mean, a whole host of other uh, issues can, can come from magnesium def deficiency. Uh, it can be a root cause of anxiety, depression, insomnia, stress. Uh, all of those things combined are contributing factors to issues that a lot of people face. Ned has come out with the product Mellow, which is a magnesium um, product. It's a powerful daily super blend, and it contains three of the most bioavailable and nutrient-dense forms of chelated magnesium on Earth. Two of the most stress-busting aminos, GABA and L-theanine, and over 70 trace minerals. Mellow is truly in a league of its own. It offers 300-plus benefits to help with better sleep and optimal health and wellness. It comes in four very delicious flavors. There's lemon, lavender berry, pomegranate, and naked, which is a stripped-down flavor-free version that's great for adding to smoothies, coffee, shakes, shakes etc., uh, the folks at Ned have spent over three years developing their best-selling Mellow Magnesium Super Blend, um, and it's uh, you know they've really gone to the ends of the earth to create one of the best magnesium products on the planet. Become the best version of yourself and get fifteen percent off Ned products with code Mike Drop, all caps, all one word. Go to helloned.com forward slash Mike Drop or enter code Mike Drop at the checkout. That's helloned.com slash Mike Drop to get 15% off. These statements and products have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease or condition. Is there a scenario that exists where if a client was willing to pay enough uh, to enlist you guys to increase your capability to rescue them at the International Space Station? Like, is that a thing? Would, would that ever be a thing, or is that total Hollywood shit? No, it's uh, right. I mean, we would absolutely do that. In fact, um, I'm a, I suck at a lot of things, but what I don't suck at is, like, dreaming big. And I always dream big. So I have people ask me, like, hey, Brandon, where is your company going to be in 20 years? People laugh at me, but I'm like, dude, we're going to be rescuing people in space. Yeah. Like, awesome. we're sending yeah. people to space, man. We're yeah. going to be space PJs and yeah. rescuing people in space. And so um, 
Yeah, it's it's pretty funny. Uh, there, there's it's actually not a, that crazy of a concept. I mean, if you think about folks are going to in 20 years from now, there's going to be people living on the moon, maybe living on Mars. You know, there's going to be a f- lot of people living out in in low Earth orbit in space stations of various kinds. Um, there is going to be a need for people to go and get them and bring them home. Yeah. Um, and so uh, what I would love is, and, and I know because the cool thing about our company is that we work with all the different space providers out there. Um, not just one, we're not, you know, working for just one single company. And so we know that there are companies out there that have capabilities that we can, uh, you know, basically procure one of their assets and, and have it on alert to go do that very thing and come back and land at an international airport. Yeah. Man, like that's, that's really cool. Yeah. So anyway, that, that's where, yeah. I, that's where I'd love to be in 20 years. Yeah. We'll see if it happens. Yeah. But, um, I, so I, I, if I can get into your business a little bit with, uh, it, like if a client comes in you and comes to you and says, Hey, we, we want to enlist your services. Do they pay like a retainer, um, to have you on station? Is it total customized based on what, what they want or are there different options? And also, is there a different price if they actually have to use you? Like if, if you're yeah. going through the motions, whatever, nothing happens, it's this price. If we actually have to come bail you out, then it's going to be this much. Is that how you structure it? Yeah, it is. Um, now, what I hope is in the future, we hope that there's enough volume that they can, the customer can pay into a uh, retainer where, hey, we always have a team on alert and here's our assets and they're always here. And um, if you get in a bad day, we're going to come get you. Because guess what? If, if there is an incident where um, th- there's a rocket that explodes or, or somebody's off nominal, it doesn't matter if it's NASA, SpaceX, Boeing, Blue Origin, anybody, the whole industry stops and takes a tactical pause, takes a knee. Um, so uh, we would love to have a team that's f- on alert 24 seven for no matter who's flying. But the fact of the matter is right now, that's not a possibility because there's not enough volume out there. Yeah. So we're finding ourselves basically contracting with companies and we're doing it per launch. And we're basically just saying, Hey, here's what it costs. And we were very transparent. Here's what it costs. Like we're not making this up. Here's what it is. Here's our markup, which is reasonable. Um, and, and if we have to execute a rescue, it's, here's what we estimate it's going to be. Um, and, uh, but you know, at that point you got to just have the checkbook open, open because a rescue could, could be very expensive. I mean, depending on where it is and and what's going on, if it's, uh, you know, international water, stuff like that, I mean, it can get expensive real quick. And at that point, um, what we have found is that, you know, the client's like, Hey, listen, if there's an actual rescue, um, you guys full rain, man, just go, go and get them, bring them home safely to their families. Uh, yeah. you know, we're not worried about cost at that point. And yeah. we're also not out trying to, we're, we're not trying to screw the industry. We're not, we, we didn't start the company to get rich. Um, we had the op, not that we didn't have the opportunity, but we were approached, uh, two separate occasions, one to be bought out by a company and another one to be exclusive for a company. And we said no to both. And the reason is because there is no other company like ours out there. And if we were to work for one specific company, then the other people that would be launching would be, would, would not have us in, and they would use that as a competitive advantage, which is, which yeah. is not a good idea. Right. Yeah. So like, Hey, um, we're the only people that have this rescue service. So if you fly with us, it's safe. If you fly with them, you know, go get bent. So, um, and I don't know, I, I don't believe that was their motivation. They were probably just saw, you know, three military dudes starting a company and figured that we needed some help and they wanted to, you know, kind of take us in and that's the only way to do it. But we said no, because we wanted to support the entire industry. We wanted to make a difference. And in our community in the, in the PJ community, we live by the motto that others may live. And it's not that, you know, that some may live if you're part of this company, right? Yeah. So that's yeah. kind of why. <laughs> some may live if your checkbook's deep enough. Some may live if enough. you fly with us, yeah. whoever we may be. Yeah. yeah. So your company right now, you guys do have C-130s and uh, helicopters. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, how, how many of them do you have? Well, um, we don't own them. Oh. We, uh, you know, we contract with international air response. They, they have like 14 C-130s uh, and, and we typically have, um, you know, two to make one and then helicopters, it'll be three to make two. And uh, our helicopters, we, 
right now we have we have one that's always on alert and then we have one that we can tap into that's flying clearing the range and stuff like that they're both rescue hoist alert you know capable and then there's other helicopter companies out there that that we um that that do similar things as well that you know uh like uh, for instance the um when taking the astronauts off the ship at the end when they land in the water that's a company that uh, uh called uh, air center they fly h225s um you know they they are a company that we could work with in the future but right now we're working with a company based out of melbourne uh, archangel or um uh, universal air service they call sign archangel and uh, they're phenomenal to work with they fly the s76 and it's a Norwegian Coast Guard helicopter that, you know, came over. They retrofitted. They used to this. They used to fly for Blackwater and do a bunch of stuff overseas. These helicopter pilots that fly with these guys have, like, um, anywhere from fifteen to 20,000 hours of flying helicopters, which wow. it's insane flying with them versus flying with the military folks. You know, they fly 1,000 hours. They put a big patch on their, on their shoulder, and they're super proud of it. These guys are flying, you know, 15... 20,000 hours I and mean, it's insane the wow. uh just the level of competency of these folks flying these helicopters so we're working with them right now and we hope to you know have a long-term relationship with them and we do but that that's what we have on our slate on our rescue posture now in our op center we have uh flight docks we have coast guard uh lno that's not officially wearing a coast guard badge but um you know they're somebody that's either on leave or recently retired that when they pick up the phone and they call the rcc they're not calling a 1-800 number they're calling their friend jim that they've worked with for 20 years right yeah. and so we have folks like that that are looking at the ambir where all the ships are and all that stuff so we have folks already working in our op center we have about um uh, nine people working on just trying to make sure we have a way out of there once yeah. we commit our forces to jump in and everything from air LNOs to coast guard to mission coordinators, uh, you know, different folks, uh, work in these sort of, um, uh, uh, plans and strategies. But then, uh, they're also talking to the coast guard up the entire East coast. And, uh, and we have rings showing, where the helicopters are stationed with the Coast Guard, and and, the, and we have a live chat going, and the Coast Guard's in that chat, and they see where we're at and what we're doing. And so um, part of our response posture, although the Coast Guard can't officially sit alert for commercial missions, they're fully aware of what's going on. They're fully aware of our capabilities, and they're actually tied into our chats and into our rooms. And if they have assets available, uh, they, uh, they help you know, increase our posture by having yeah. helicopters to come get our guys out of the water. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of moving parts and uh, stuff to keep track of. Busy. No, no doubt about it. D does it make sense business wise for you guys to really ever own your own aircraft or? It's a great question. We, uh, we, we tried to stay out of that business, uh, because, um, man, aviation is, uh, it's complex yeah. and, you know, aircraft break and, 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 and there's always something going on. And so we're not the experts in the aircraft. So we have tried to bring the experts in to yeah. run that for us. Um, now it, there's some reason that there's some times when it would make sense to have our own aircraft. For instance, um, if we are pulling a full-time posture, uh, of alert where we, you know, we need to have dedicated assets for sure. And we have a plan to have dedicated assets. Now, whether we own them or not, that comes down to, we've been in negotiations right now because, um, FAA rules, you know, the folks that are flying under aircraft. You can fly in a different posture, uh, if they are employees of your company or they're working for you directly. Right. So, um, so we're looking into all of that and does it make sense for us to be co-owners of, you know, go in with somebody who has all the right certificates and all the right airframes. And then we just, uh, you know, we're partnering with them. We have a joint venture or something like that. So we're currently exploring all of that right now. We're working it through having exclusive relationships and, uh, you know, good contracts and then just good relationships, uh, with, with these companies that, that are doing the right thing for the right reason. So, um, I don't know. It's a, it's a great question. We do, we have grappled with that a lot. Do we have our own aircraft? What we're not going to do is we're not going to go and like take the secret sauce of the people we're flying with currently. And then like, okay, well now we're going to go get our own stuff and yeah. you guys can, you know, go get bent. Like we're not going to do that. If anything, it would be like, okay, we have somebody that's going to come in and write the check for this. 
will you partner with us and fly this? Will you put this on your type certificate or can we get in some sort of an agreement to where it makes sense that we're doing this uh, under the same flag, right? So I, I don't I don't really care if it's our name on the side of the airplane or not. Um, I just care that it's, you know, we have a dedicated asset that's always ready to go and it's the right asset with the right trained people flying it. So um that that's where it really makes sense is if is if it's like well we have no quality control they're, they're bringing in all these hocus pocus pilots that can't yeah. you know at that point it's yeah you know what we need our own aircraft because then we can control who's flying it right yeah. so that reminds me of uh, like the oil field uh, like exxon mobil they don't own the oil rigs that, that drill for them you know they for that matter they don't own really anything you know they, <laughs> they rent everything uh for that reason because you know the fluctuation and a barrel of oil price, you know, uh, oil fields drying up, you know, permits. I mean, there's so many intangibles that they can't control that if they owned all that stuff, you know, they'd be constantly fire selling shit and then having to buy yeah. stuff, you know, so they just rent everything. But um, so going back, like where your company is at now, if we kind of take a few steps back in terms of what led up to it, your time working for slash at NASA, can you kind of uh, walk us through what, what that was all about? Yeah. So, um, first of all, I, like probably many people on your show here, um, if you were to tell me like 15 years ago that I'd be doing what I'm doing now, I think you're smoking peyote yeah, like, same or something here. like I, it, yeah. yeah, same here. It's like, you know, I'm not, I'm not, there's no way I, I probably couldn't spell rocket, you know, yeah. 15 years ago I was, you know, nugging it out as a PJ. Um, and, uh, so I'm going to step back to active duty, getting off of active duty. You know, I, I, heard in my bio you said you know seven deployments i did those back to back to back to back uh small family getting burnt out so i i needed a change needed to take a knee for a little while and uh but i didn't want to get out of the community completely so i became a reservist and i worked at this company uh called angel thunder and um sounds like an 80s action movie dude it is <laughs> now it's called red flag rescue yeah. uh but back then it was called angel thunder and it was the coolest job um it's 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 it rivals the job i have now we planned a war and yeah. it was like yeah a two-week exercise multi-million dollar exercise and actually uh, zach if you look up um there's a uh on youtube it'll say um it's called terror in the canyon k gun nine K Gun Nine was the uh, was the uh, news outlet that covered it, but my job was to plan this freaking war, uh, and 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 there was seven of us that would plan this thing, and um, and we would invite everybody to come play, and so we had you know the SEALs and the Rangers and and ODA teams, and then we had twenty five different com countries that would come and play. All the three letter agencies, FBI, you know, all of those State Department, all those folks would come and they would play in our exercise where we would put on a war. We would rent out uh, a whole city in Playas, New Mexico, and uh, you know, live fire. I mean, you name it. We would we would just run this exercise, and everybody could come play for free with one caveat: you had to have some sort of a personnel recovery uh, you know, event in your, and, and that was to run your checklist. That was uh, the, the, the Marines when they, you know, CV goes down or something, they needs to know how they're going to trigger the PR system. And then eventually what, what would happen is it would allow our air force rescue folks, which is the only dedicated rescue, um, um, agency in the entire DOD. So dedicated for all services. So it would trigger a rescue event, which our folks would come in and fly helicopters, C one thirties, PJs would jump in and do all this stuff. So it would trigger some sort of a response. And and if it didn't, it didn't. But like you know, we had Marine, you know, raiders uh, up in the hillsides watching compounds and doing all this. We had all these role players that go out and their, their only job was just to go out and, you know, kill a chicken and pray to Allah every, you know, it, it was the coolest job ever. And in my job, I was a logistics dude. And so like, uh, it was, it was way outside my comfort zone, but, uh, I was trying to figure out how to like put freaking propane turrets on the back of an M razor so that we could shoot at the A tens when they're coming over and, you know, and people could call us. It was like the coolest job just trying yeah. to figure all this stuff out. Um, so I was working at that job for about three years as a contractor. And b before you go past that, uh, was it once a year? Once a year, man, two weeks. It was yeah. a two week exercise. Okay. Yeah. Once a year, 25 different nations would come in and wow. play. It was wild. Was there a kind of a gist of the, 
of the scenario or was it different each time or what, like what was the, the, the exercise? All the scenarios were different. And so it depended on who was playing and we would have massive planning conferences and they would all come in and they'd sit around a table. And basically what we would say is like, Hey, um, uh, we are, we will bring the tire. You plug your spoke in, uh, to the tire. So if you are, um, let's say you are like, you fly, um, some jamming, um, you know, some jamming airplane. Like an E2C. Okay. Yeah. 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 Then what we're going to do is we're going to bring in the dudes that jam as well, and they're going to test your systems. And then we're going to have other people that are, you know, that, that are now trying to see if they can see your sensors, seeing our sensors, seeing their sensors. And so, it, so basically what we would do is when I say plan a war, we would just basically bring in all these different people with different capabilities and we would have them, you know, run and, and, and then we would uh, bring planners from their agencies in and have them plan scenarios that made sense. Yeah. And so uh, all the scenarios are different. You know, you might have like an ODA team that just says, uh, hey, we need to practice if there's an IED in a building, you know, where, so they may clear, you know, five houses. And then on the sixth house, on the fourth day, they're going in to clear the house and there's a landslide, you know, something happens and they all, and, and, and the building collapses. And there's, you know, a couple dummies that are in there and we, you know, remote detonate the house put some dummies in there and that triggers, okay, what are you going to do if that happens? Right. And, um, and so, um, and, 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 and so that's, you never knew what the scenarios were. Actually, one of the coolest that, that I helped plan was we did off of, uh, off of San Diego, San Clemente Island, which you're very familiar with. We did, um, there was a ship that uh, there was all these, um, you know, uh, enemy assets that were coming near the ship and there was a there was somebody on board the ship like a mass casualty or something a, a fire a cup you know some fire on board and our guys had to go get that dude off of the ship well as they were coming in it was a contested area so the a-10s were coming in and shooting up all the drone boats out there and all that stuff and and while they were on the ship they had to do an extrication scenario because the guy was pinned down so our guys were having to you know do extrication on the ship while while the JTAC was on board the ship calling in cast from the A-10s shooting drone boats. And, and I mean, that was like bad. Our guys parachuted into the boat and did all that stuff, which was oh, really, cool. really cool yeah. to see that all come together. Now, of course, if you talk to the guys in the weeds, um, they actually, they would call it anal plunger, you know, and <laughs> anal blunder and all these acronyms because they're like, they're like, Oh, this sucks. This is totally not this. None of this is real. It's all yeah. fake. We're LARPing and this and that. I mean, you know, guys will complain about yeah. anything. And yeah, so find a bag of golden bitch, how heavy it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So, um, I say all that to say, uh, it, it was a cool job, but what wasn't cool is I spent 30 years in the desert. Yeah. And then all my deployments were to the desert and we were just tired of the desert. And so my wife and I were on our way to uh, church. Um, and, um, I, and my, my boss was telling me that NASA was looking for a PJ to, uh, uh, you know, to work for work for NASA and, uh, and to build the commercial crew program. And so I was joking with my wife that my boss was trying to get rid of me and, uh, and, and, I had had a resume already done up because I was looking at maybe getting a job in Portland as a full-time PJ at the, at the reserve unit there. So I had a resume already done, but I was kind of joking around about how, you know, there was this, um, there was this job out and, and NASA looking for a PJ. I was like, but there's no way I would ever get that. I was like a, maybe an, uh, an E six at the time and the reserves even maybe not even an E seven, but, uh, I knew that this was one of those jobs. It was a higher level GS job. And I, I knew it was one of those jobs that there was going to be a line out the door of PJ chiefs and, you know, colonels and majors and all these other crow combat rescue officers that were going to apply for that job. Uh, and I was just kind of joking around about it. Well, my wife went in behind my back and actually applied for me. Really? Yeah, because she wanted to get the hell out of Tucson. How did, how did that uh, set with you, her doing that? Well, it set great because, really? I mean, to, to be fair, I wanted the job, but I didn't believe in myself, man. I thought there was no way I would be able to get that job. So my wife believing in me and like, no, you can get, you can do this. And of course, because we're people of faith, she's like, listen, if God opens a door, we walk through it, you know? And so, um, so she applied for me, even though I didn't have the balls to do it. And <laughs> next thing you know... Uh, <laughs> actually, so, uh, what well, she applied and it came back that I am, uh, overqualified. Well, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm highly, highly qualified, but then I had to submit a second round of questionnaires. 
So I'm going to tell you a little ninja trick that I did, okay? Uh, you have to get past the robot and the big machine when you're applying for a government job. Now, I don't know if this still works, and I'm not, I don't, I'm not a GS anymore, so I could share this. But I went in and I took the job description from NASA, and I highlighted the whole thing, and I put it at the very bottom of my resume in point like zero one font, and I changed the color to white, so it just it was it just wasn't it wasn't there. It was like invisible if you print my resume, mm. but all the keywords were there. Yeah. And so when it went through the machine, it was like over yeah really? so the first round i just i got in the door and i was like okay you're you know you're being considered and then the second round's got to get past the second round of machines it's like holy shit this guy is like created for this job and all, <laughs> you and, tricky fuck yeah and all i was trying to do and, and this is for anybody out there listening all i was trying to do was get on the phone with somebody who can actually make a decision like i wanted i just Give me the chance to do an interview and then turn me down. Tell me how much I suck, but at least, at least tell me that over the yeah, phone. Yeah. And that's uh, so, yeah, I got the interview and it was a guy. Um, it's kind of a legend in our community, a guy named Don Shelton. And, uh, and you know, I was real frank with him. I was like, Don, you know, man, I, I don't have a lot of skill sets you look for. I, I, I'm not really ever been a part of the space industry. I don't even, I don't know anything about it. I was like, but I'm hungry and I'm, and I'm willing to learn, man. And I'm willing to do the hard work. And I'm willing to get in the trenches and I'm willing to be the Indian that, that, that you need, man, just hard working, whatever you need. And so, uh, and that's what he said to me. He was like, you know what? Um, when he hired me later, he, he reflected back on our interview. He's like, you know, uh, I did have a lot of chief supply and I had a lot of, um, you know, senior, uh, even, even senior officers apply. He was like, but I needed, I needed, a, a hardworking Indian, not a chief. You know what I mean? And so um, he said, I don't want somebody that's going to kick their feet up and tell other people what to do. I need somebody that's going to do the hard work in the trenches, learn how to develop something out of nothing. And and honestly, because of my experience working at Angel Thunder and trying to figure out how to get diesel fuel in Playas, New Mexico, working with the EPA and all the logistical burdens of like problem solving, uh, it actually opened the door for me to um, to show these folks I had what it take it took to actually go and to start a program and to uh, try to develop it. Wow, that's awesome! I mean, and I think it speaks volumes to uh, how important of a role attitude plays in life and even in something as microcosmy, if that's a word, as a, as an interview. You know, I agree with you, man. And I'll tell you now, I'm in the other seat as an employer, yeah. right? So I'm, you know, I'm interviewing people, and um, uh, I. I don't even look at their resume. I don't get it. I'm a guy that has, you know, multi, uh, two master's degrees, but I don't give a shit about like degrees or education. I care about attitude. I could teach somebody how to, I could teach them the skills, but I can't teach them the attitude they yeah. got to have to, to be hungry, to want it, to have that excellent spirit. And so, um, that's what, that's what I look for in an employer. And I would like to hope America has shifted now to where employers are actually weighing experience and attitude far more than they are education. Yeah. Uh, cause I've met so many paper tigers and sitting yeah. in my position as a senior enlisted dude too. Um, I can tell you when we're, you know, going through awards packages and all that stuff, man, you will see people that look phenomenal on paper. And if you pick up the phone and you call somebody there, uh, you'll, you'll get a pretty quick reaction of what they're actually about. Yeah. And you want to hear something crazy, uh, off topic a little bit, but, um, the way astronauts, like I, I've, I, I, you know, I, I've known a lot of them and several of them work, work with my company and, uh, and, uh, interesting story. So if you wanted to be an astronaut, you know, they, I, I've heard this, I, I, I can't speak from personal experience, but I've heard this and, and I love it. They will actually call, you know, the reference you put. And they'll call the reference and say, hey, I want you to give me somebody that worked for this person. And they'll call and they'll say, give me the most junior person at this organization. And that's what they're going to interview and they're going to ask about. They, they don't care if you know some four-star general and you know, you know, and you're name dropping this person. that They want to know who's worked for you and mm -hmm. what they think of you. Oh, that's cool. And I love that interview tactic. In fact, I've adopted that. Whenever somebody gives me a reference and um you know they want me to uh they name drop somebody really really important that they know uh, i don't i don't even bother with that person i want to know who's worked for you and what do they think of you yeah that's that's brilliant i love it um and yeah speaks volumes that's really cool um so what was the once you got picked up in that uh what would you call it a division and yeah what? so it was uh it was, it was um at the time it was it was called it's changed 
names several times, but at the time it was um, DDMS, Defense Department Manned Spaceflight Support. Uh, it changed to Detachment 3, and now it's like uh, Detachment 1, I think, and they work directly for First Air Force. But at the time, it was DDMS. Um, so day one of DDMS, let me, <laughs> this is a great story. Let me tell you this. So uh, I moved my whole family from Arizona to Florida, and um, the government civilian, uh, you know, re human resourcing people are terrible. And I mean, freaking terrible. So I, I had no idea. All I had was like a date I was supposed to report. So they didn't pay for my travel. They didn't pay for anything. Like I literally had to get my whole family out there. So I came up with this great idea that I was going to take um, a car hauler and I was going to build a box around it to make, you know, to put all my stuff in and do a Diddy move. And then yeah. I was going to sell the trailer when I got there. And, and all that worked except for the fact that I built it way too heavy and I blew like eight tires and I had my whole, you know, and, and it was, it was actually, a, it was actually a terrible idea hindsight, but I move all my family and, and I, and I, to pull this big ass trailer, I had to get a, a F-350. I got a, a 1995 F-350 diesel bulletproof engine, man. It's a freaking, it's a badass truck. If, if, you know, and I, I mean, still that, uh, that engine is just, it, it's incredible. So I, I get this truck. I'm driving my, uh, driving my, uh, dogs, my wife and my kids will not drive with me in this truck. So I got my freaking dogs and I'm, I'm, I'm pulling cross country, blowing tires. I pick up a hitchhiker on the way, believe it or not. And like this dude, I, it's the weirdest stuff ever, man. The guy staying with me in the hotel is so weird. Uh, blowing axles and, uh, I mean, literally tires catching on fire. It was a terrible move. Well, my family flies in and meets me at the airport, and I got this trailer parked, and, and we're drive, we drive to the, uh, uh, to the base, and we're like, hey, we're here checking in. They're like, well, um, we don't have your records here. Uh, you're not, you know, you're not supposed to, wh why would you move your family without having a, you know, this form and this form? I'm like, because I don't know how your system works. I had a report date and I showed up, you know? And, uh, so I had nowhere to go. I hadn't, I had nowhere to go. So my family and what little money we had, were like staying in a freaking hotel on the eighth floor of the Hilton, uh, with two dogs and two young kids. My kids were young. I mean, this was in 2015. So, you know, my, I mean, my, my son was in diapers. My, you know, my daughter was still super young and we're up on the eighth floor with dogs. Dogs are shitting in the room. It was freaking terrible. Well, my first day to work, uh, I, I finally get it all worked out. And I'm going into work. And um, I'm driving in after having the, just the most terrible, like, week and a half of my life, staying in a hotel with my family, being frustrated and traveling and moving and all that stuff. And uh, driving in, and I see, for the first time in my whole life, I see an actual launch, a space launch. Have you ever seen one? I mean, not in person. No. In person. It's, 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 it's incredible. And yeah. I, I had never seen one before because I grew up in Arizona. In fact, I never really spent a lot of time around the ocean other than PJ stuff. So, you know, just driving up the coast, US-1 with the river, beautiful green grass. I was getting out on the side of the road taking pictures of the, of the sideway, uh, the highway because it was like grass and I wasn't used to that because I was in the desert. So anyway, I'm mesmerized with this place. I see this rocket launch. It instantly lifts my spirit. This was June 28th of, uh, of, of 2015. And the reason I remember that date, because I'm driving in all of a sudden I see this launch. It's the coolest thing I've ever seen. And all of a sudden the damn thing does a spiral and then blows up. Oh, wow. <laughs> Oh, and man. I don't know if it's supposed to do that, you yeah, know. I'm pretty sure it's not supposed it's, to. Do I, it. I was like, man, maybe it's you know it went into hyperdrive and now it's really going yeah. into orbit. I, you just see something blow up, right? And you could you could even see this on uh, on, on YouTube and on that date, uh, my very first day of work, man. Yeah. Kid you not. So I go in. Finally, I get in and I go to report into Don Shelton, who's the guy that hired me. I'm like, Don, I'm here, and uh, I was like, man, what's it? you know, what's all that business with that space stuff? He was like, oh yeah, that was a SpaceX rocket. You know, they were doing this and this and this and it blew up. And uh, by the way, uh, your program is SpaceX and I need you to figure out here's how to rescue here, people out of this thing. And here's a fucking broom, get to work. So Man, uh, that was my first day at work and it was, yeah, it was wild. And so then I worked with uh, SpaceX, phenomenal company, man. Like as, you know, uh, just business wise, if you look at companies that are tall and companies that are flat, SpaceX is very flat. I mean, you know, the NASA equivalent, you have like a GS 15 talking to a 24 year old college student 
and they have the same decision authority. You yeah. know, like at yeah. NASA, it's like a 60 year old dude talking to like a 24 year old SpaceX engineer. But what I love about it is that they move quick, they make calculated risk, and they're not afraid to fail. And so I saw them just really take off, and I got to see them you know, work alongside uh, Boeing as well as working with Boeing as well, who's the other commercial provider and just watching how incredibly brilliant these folks are at SpaceX, even though they, you know, they're, they're, their mistakes are big and on TV and they do that on purpose. They're like, we're not afraid to fail. Uh, a lot to work with. Um, you know, every once in a while you run into some ego stuff and, uh, you know, and you gotta, got, gotta be able to work through that, but help SpaceX with everything man from developing their spacesuit you know to like hey man you need you need some rescue loops here and here and to their capsule with hey this is what frequencies we need you to talk on this is how we need you to talk that this is how you need to prepare for survival and so i mean hundreds of hours of telecons working with them going to hawthorne looking at the early developments of the spaceship going out on the bards that they you know were blowing up rockets on and just working hand in hand with spacex and boeing Going to the neutral buoyancy lab with uh, with the uh, Orion project, the Artemis project, the, the the NASA thing, you know, just figuring out how to flip spaceships and do all this really cool stuff. And then once we got the whole program eventually built, um, you know, then then we started uh, we started training dudes how to how to go and uh, take a step back. Like this was the challenge I had early on. I'll tell you because it's kind of a funny story. Like. Well, how do you build a program to rescue astronauts? So we hadn't rescued astronauts uh, out of a capsule since Apollo. Yeah. Right. So when shuttle went away, uh, by the way, that was a man, that was a terrible, terrible idea on our government. You, any idea how much we were paying the Russians per seat uh, to go to the space station when the shuttle went away? I mean, I can't even imagine. Dude, it went up to, so it started about, I think it was about six million it started with per seat. When shuttle went away, um, it went up to 90 million per seat. What? We were paying the Dude. Russians and the Russian government to put U.S. Service, U.S. astronauts on their capsules. So so the commercial crew program was great because it's like, hey, we're going to bring these back. And it's publicly advertised that they were like, SpaceX is charging 55 million a seat, which is still an uh, incredible amount of money. But that 55 million is going back into our U.S. economy. Yeah. It's creating jobs. And and, and, and and so, you know, it was a great thing. The, my only rub with it was that shuttle went away and we had no way to get there other than the Russians. So so they could jack the price up whatever they wanted. And, uh, you know, in the last um, shuttle launch, I think it was in 2011. And then, uh, you know, we didn't launch humans again until 2018. So there's seven years of the Russians just being able to freaking rake us over the coals, man. Oh. And so... Um, yeah, I got, got to work with them. But then how do you take a space program and you figure out like, well, what kind of shit do you need to rescue somebody out of a capsule? Um, you know, it's, it's like, uh, I, I don't know, man. So I, I literally, I busted out the pararescue UTC, which is unit type code. It's like um, 37 pages of equipment. And it's like, do I need a carabiner do i need a rifle no i don't need a rifle do i need uh this no i, I don't think i need that do i need it? so i literally went line by line through the whole U 37 pages of the utc and figured out what i thought we needed you know boats and freaking you know we needed carabiners and ropes and you know we needed hazard detectors and scuba gear and we needed some of this stuff so line by line went through it and then I vetted that list off of some of the smart folks and much smarter than me in the community, but that would not go through 37 pages of shit, yeah. you know, they just sent them like, Hey, this is what I came up with. What do you guys think? Yeah. 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 That looks good. Right. And so then we had to test it and then we had to, you know, build it, test it. So we brought in the test agencies. They came up with a, like way cooler ideas on how to do stuff. Like we actually, to stabilize the spaceship, we actually tow it with a jet ski. Oh, really? Like, yeah. 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 So, um, and, and this is, you know, during Apollo, it was short and squatty. So when it landed in the water, they could put an inflation ring around it and it would and it would stabilize it. But with SpaceX, because of the way it is, it's like taking that water bottle and throwing it in the water uh, half full. It's going to bob around like crazy. And even if you put a ring around it, it's just going to it's still going to bob around. So the way to uh, to stabilize it is to actually tow it. And so um, we had our test folks figure this out. A guy named Koa Bailey. Um, he's actually a commander now at one of the units that, uh, you know, within the ops group I work at. And uh, he came up with this idea of towing it with a, with a jet ski. So then we had to figure out, well, uh, okay, well, those jet skis, 
and this is where this is where the headaches come in. We start working with Natick. I don't know if you've worked with Natick drop and stuff, but mm. you start working with all the red tape of the military of like, well, that's not certified to airdrop, and well, that model is, but that model is a 2008, and you can't buy that model anymore. Well, hey, the new model is just same weight and dimensions as the last model. Yeah, but they may have changed around some of the components on the inside and this and this and this. So we got to do drop test again. So we do drop tests again, and that costs a ton of money and takes a lot of time to get these jet skis certified. Well, then uh, what happens? By the time they're certified, that model's two years old. We can't buy yeah. the new model. So, yeah, it's just a huge headache. So, I mean, there's a lot of logistical headaches along the way, but eventually we get this program to maturity where now we are bringing in PJs from different units and having them train uh, you know, to actually go and do this mission and, and, and understanding space physiology and all of the stuff that goes into it. Um, and, and by the way, I'm focusing on like the tactical side of it. Cause that's what I know. That's what I built, but there was a whole nother team of folks, uh, that were working on, uh, you know, all of the orders writing, which is primarily what our organiz the organization I used to work for does is they work with the SecDef and they you know, figure out in the SDOB how this is actually tasked to units and, and what it flows through Stratcom and how what order then goes over to, you know, to this book. And then how, how do you actually task a military combat unit to go and do this mission? How do you task airlift? What happens if this app, you know, and so uh, that, that was the majority of the heavy lifting in our organization was paperwork wise and I had the great job I, I don't know how I've always fallen into these good gigs man I've literally just fallen into them but I fell into the good gig of being able to just do the tactical stuff and focus on that which was a lot of fun yeah Oh, it sounds like it I mean it's some fascinating stuff that I think most people have no idea that exists myself included I do need to take one step back and revisit something. Uh, you said you pitch, picked up a hitchhiker and let him stay in your fucking hotel room? That was weird, man. Can I, I ask what the fuck it. you were thinking with that? I, yeah, no. I don't even, so that, <laughs> good question. Uh, so I was, I was at like a gas station and uh, this dude came up and he gave me his sob story and I believed him and he said he needed to go to this like trailer park in Florida and uh, he pulled on some of my, you know, my spiritual cords of like, you know, Hey man, this is this, this I'm down and out and this is what, you know, and I, man, I, 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 I'm trying to change my life and turn everything around. And, uh, and, and this is the place I need to go to change my life. And, and I believed him. And so, um, sure enough, man, I mean, his story for the most part checked out. I dropped him off at some trailer park. His mom came out and brought me some like, uh, you know, freaking tamales and gave me a big hug and thanked yeah. me for that. And it was, yeah, I rolled the dice, but I, I thought about it. I was like, well, uh, I mean, I was well armed and, you know, I mean, I think if, uh, you know, if we were to be more trusting in trying to take care of our fellow citizens, uh, if we were all like that and that generous and that kind, I think it'd be a much better place. So I just, yeah. sometimes I, I don't always do it, but when I do it, I, I you know, I, I kind of go big on it. Like, yeah, man, I'll trust yeah. you. I'll pay, pay for your, pay for your Arby's too, you know, yeah. along yeah. the way. So I, th I think in that position, a good litmus is say, you got to blow me while I drive. <laughs> Now, bear with me. I'm not going to actually have them blow me, but I want to know that the dedication is there. <laughs> you want to make sure they're, they're yeah. that dedicated. Yeah, well, and, I know uh, you're serious. Like, uh, yeah. you know, it's not, you it's, really, it's not really, like, you're going to have to really give me roadhead the entire way there. Well, and, and if and you're like, all right, fine, I'll do it. Be like, get in the car. You're not touching it, but. Dude, a 1995 F-350, the kind of people that I would attract, they would expect to see with a homemade trailer, <laughs> pull it, dude, with two dogs in the yeah. back and no, you know, air, air, yeah. they would expect to see that on the road. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, so you spent eight years there. Um, six years. Six yeah. years building the program, and then ultimately, uh, once that wrapped up, kind of gave you the idea to get uh, your own company started and what have you. Are there any any other stories from the six years spent there, uh, bad launches or uh, just interesting, cool stories of things either going horribly wrong or completely right? Did you did you ever meet Elon? Uh, anything uh, of note from that time there? I mean, it just every day was a new adventure. So I, I really enjoyed going to Hawthorne and uh, I never met Elon. Um, but a lot of the SpaceX employees that I worked with, like all the way up to uh, I don't know what employee number it was, but let's just say employee 500. They, every single one of them had to um, interview with Elon directly. 
Really? Every single one of them. Yeah. So it was, it was wild. Um, and you know, including you. No, no, no. no. I, so I didn't work for SpaceX. I'm talking about all the SpaceX employees. eh? So, uh, but what I saw was an interesting, um, there was a lot of very interesting people. So I I could see that the sort of folks that Elon was hiring was the type of people that were not just smart, but, uh, and not just articulate, but the folks that would think outside the box and what, you know, and so standard engineers are not you know a lot of them are very confound yeah they're inside the box and nope it's got to compute and it's got to add up and 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 most of these cats i worked with were outside the box while and you'd have to kind of rein them in a little bit like whoa there man like hey i take a risk for a living but dude that's wild like come on man let's 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 uh let's let's walk that down a little bit um so, uh, but like, I remember the first time I went to, uh, Hawthorne, uh, it was, it was wild and, and like they have, uh, coffee, you know, coffee stations all around with baristas. They have a full like cafeteria and, you know, and you're not allowed to like pay money because, or, or, you know, you got to buy like these little tokens cause you're a government employee. And so, but, but there's no money exchanged at this place. So every SpaceX employee, you know, I think it may have changed now. I think they're on like meal cards or something, but like the most wild stuff you would eat in this cafeteria. Like first time I remember <laughs> what was on the menu is like kangaroo loin. Right? Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, so wow. I had kangaroo loin at like yeah. SpaceX headquarters. Right. Wow, and like, wow. and as you're walking down, you know, you get finished eating and you grab your cup of coffee and there's like cool stuff everywhere. It's all eclectic. And then like, like out in the open area, you'll have some guy working on a freaking rocket engine, like right there out in the open. And you could like YouTube some of these videos of like, it's just the coolest place to experience. And then, you know, you keep walking down and they have this 3d printer where they 3d printed, you know, all this cool metal stuff. And it's just, uh, it's just a really wild experience. Um, so, you know, that was a cool experience. Uh, a lot of historical NASA stuff that, um, like I, I actually here in Texas at, at Johnson space center, we do a lot of work there and get to go on the mission control floor. Well, before it like turned into a museum, I got to go into the, uh, old launch area where they, you know, actually they had their full launch control center to like send people to the moon. And, you know, they have all the stations. They still had ashtrays and stuff from like the seventies and like the big red phone you pick up to talk to the president, you know, and all this stuff, like it's all legit and it's all there. So I got like pictures take, you know, of me like on that phone and all this cool stuff. And now like, you can't even, you can't even walk anywhere near there, breathe there because it's, you know, it's like, totally controls like a national monument or something. But uh, so it's really cool that I got to experience a lot of that stuff. And then just walking around to some of the different agencies within NASA, um, you know, I talked to people and they're like, Oh, Hey, check this out. You know, this was left here when I got here, you know, 20 years ago. And this has just been in this file cabinet, open it up. And it's like pictures of like, you know, random space stuff and like moon lawn landings. And, you know, like they, they, this one dude pulled out a photo, photograph of the original photo of like the Columbia breakup when it was oh, coming wow. back in, you know, and like, Hey, this is all the, and I was like, man, that should probably be in like a museum or something somewhere, you know? And it's just, but it's really, really neat to experience Johnson space center. And ha- ha- have you ever been there? I haven't. So there's deer everywhere, which really? is weird. Yeah, there's deer, and it's like there's all these broken down ass bikes everywhere too, hmm. uh, because like at one point, no, 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 like bicycle bikes. Like so, somebody had the great idea. Um, it's like the government often does, where hey, we're going to be green and we're going to be efficient. And we're going everybody's going to be on bikes. Well, what they didn't think about was like, uh, well, who's going to fix these damn bikes when they get a flat tire or a chain comes off? So there's all these broken bikes everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> like, God, you so know, weird. there's some people that ride the bikes, but, yeah. but, but all the, but there's like freaking broken bikes everywhere. And there's, yeah. and there's, and there's deer walking around, which is super cool. Yeah. Uh, cause again, I'm from Arizona and there's like no animals that can survive there. Yeah. And so, you know, just seeing grass and seeing deer walking around in the street, it's like really, really cool. And, uh, so it's just a different atmosphere. Not, not what I'm used to. And then the neutral buoyancy lab itself is a wild place, man. 40 feet deep pool. Um, 20 feet is below, you know, like it's at ground level, 20 feet below, 20 foot above. And they have the whole International Space Station underwater there. Mm. And uh, so getting to dive in that thing with astronauts and swimming in there and flipping spaceships. and You got uh, to do that? Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's wild. Man. Really, really cool stuff. And, uh, yeah, I got a lot of um, a lot of funny, you know, jackassery style stories of just random stuff I've <laughs> 
Can you share one of them? Well, uh, yeah. So, uh, well, so, uh, so Bob and Doug, the first dudes, uh, that Bob and Doug McKenzie from Canada. Yeah. Bob and Doug McKenzie from Canada. Uh, 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 Bob and Doug, the first two commercial crew astronauts flew in the crew dragon, um, uh, Doug Hurley and Bob Bankin, um, great guys. Uh, one, one was a Marine one, I think, uh, air force. I think Bob was an air force guy. Um, but you know, these astronauts, it's really cool to work with them and they're, and they're super smart. And what I found interesting about all these astronauts is that they will remember everything. And, and Mike, I mean, everything, everything about you. If you tell them your kids names, they will remember it all like years later. It's oh. the craziest thing. Um, so don't lie to them. Don't lie to them. And yeah. I, have, have you noticed this with like some like really high impact people, like, you know, four star generals and stuff that like, Oh yeah, I, I met you, Mike back, you know, yeah. 13 like years ago. Memory. And yeah, yeah. It's like, how in the world do you remember that man? Yeah. So all these astronauts are the same ways. <laughs> uh, but I was like the jackass. So it always, always mess with them. Like I'd always find reasons to mess with them. And so uh, Bob and Doug were over watching us do a SpaceX event and uh and we're down in the um in the basin at the um at the uh, no two basin in um in in florida there in cape canaveral and it's like maybe 15 feet down there's a big concrete barrier where you know they're just kind of standing up there watching what's going on down in the basin and i'm down in the basin and i'm like uh <laughs> like hey Bob, Doug, I, I want to show you guys something. And so they came over to look and I turn and I just rip the, the, you know, the handle, the gas on it and just spray them with water. <laughs> I thought you were going to give them the chewed bubble gum out of your, uh, out of your zipper. Well, hey, check this out. <laughs> Let me show you something. So you, you rooster tailed them. I rooster tailed yeah. them and get, you know, got them wet and they laughed. But I mean, I, I, I have, I have some, uh, just, just I, I have a lot of fond memories of just jackassery stuff of working with those sort of people that probably aren't used to that military humor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I took actually Sonny Williams, really famous astronaut. She was supposed to be um, on SpaceX originally, and we were in we were in uh, Langley, Virginia, doing um, a, a, a test with with Boeing, and they weren't sure which astronauts were going where and. And, uh, and I was, uh, busting on, uh, busting on her because I, I said, uh, and I, I said that the, um, SpaceX suits look like, uh, Power Rangers. And so she was like, she, she didn't, she was like, wait, what, what Power Rangers, you know? And she, so I literally cropped the picture of the white Power Ranger. And if you look up a picture now, people are going to be like, wow, that's staggering. If you look up a picture of the white Power Ranger and then you look up like SpaceX suits. So I cropped a picture of her face yeah. in like the white Power Ranger. I sent her a text uh, with it and uh, she never replied. But, uh, she, <laughs> <laughs> no sense. So of just, humor just, just the, no, she has a great yeah. sense of humor. And speaking yeah. of Sonny, I saw her like two weeks ago at a random bar we were doing a, a bar. It was like a restaurant. We were doing a, a an event. My company was doing an event for Sierra Space, and we got done with it, and uh, and we're just at this random restaurant. And I, I was like, "I'll be damned." That's Sonny Williams. I was like, "Sonny," and I didn't know if she would remember. I mean, I know I did some stupid stuff back in the day. She's like, "Brandon, how are your kids?" And this yeah. and that, like, and she remembered everything. Yeah. See, it was it was insane. Me being the dick that I am, I think it, with people with that kind of memory, where it's almost. Uh, like aggravating it so good i would have to gaslight him and be like i don't have any kids what are you talking about <laughs> like just but every time it's something totally different you know like no we have six adopted african children how do you not remember that i like just might every, every time steal that out of your playbook oh, you gotta man do it. Yeah. i might steal that out of your playbook yeah, and the yeah. more ridiculous each each time it gets a little more ridiculous as to what your scenario is for sure well it's yeah, not just that they have a great memory either that they're like like <laughs> soup I, I don't know how they um you know, actually can recruit for this trait, but they're super kind towards the family and the support network. Like for instance, Sonny, I was just randomly telling her that I had, you know, at the time, I think a five-year-old daughter and, oh man, she, she, you know, she, she really looks up to, you know, female astronauts and this and that. And so I'll be damned if Sonny didn't actually write a handwritten letter to oh. her, found my address and, and mailed it in the mail to yeah. my daughter, Ella. Yeah, that's awesome. uh, and I didn't even ask her for it. That's amazing. Man, that's yeah. like, that, now, that's that makes like, me not want to. Yeah. So yeah, you want to mess with them. Yeah. You want to mess with them. Mike? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe not. Now I feel like a dick. Um, no, that's, that's really cool. Um, did, were there ever instances, uh, whether it's in the buoyant, uh, neutral buoyancy tank or, or otherwise of like the, the closest call that you can remember or something going like really wrong? It's a good question. Um, yeah, let me think about that. So 
I have a funny story. Actually, I have the video of this. Uh, maybe I'll share it with you know. I'll, I'll share it with y'all right after this uh, show. But I have uh, there's can we, a. Can we post it or? Uh, I, I don't on the know. I, yeah, I guess the guy. I guess the guy is retired now. I don't. I don't think it's past the level where it'll get anybody in trouble. But there's this guy, uh, incredible guy. He's a Navy diver named Mike Geyer, and he worked at the uh, Neutral Buoyancy Lab. And so we're trying to figure out. This is before we figured out how to stabilize the SpaceX capsule. And, um, and so we are, uh, uh, out in Hawthorne now, and we have their, their cargo dragon that had actually went to space and come back. And so it was the, the cargo dragon. It was the closest thing we could find because the actual crew dragon hadn't been developed yet. So it was the closest thing we could find to the actual flight like size of the dimensions of what a, a SpaceX capsule would look like. So what we did was we took the Orion, uh, stabilization collar that it's just an inflatable collar that goes around the outside. So we took that and we put it around this uh, cargo dragon just in in Hawthorne there they're just in the little uh, basin or, or whatever you know that where, where the dot where, where the uh, the ship was was moored off at they put it in the water we put this thing around it it goes way too big so we came up with a bright idea of wow well, we'll just fold it over and cargo strap it. oh god <laughs> So we fold it over, we get our dimensions, and we cargo strap this thing down. And then we come up with a great idea to inflate this damn thing. Uh, so we inflate it, and I'm actually up on the uh, I'm I'm up on the top hatch, looking down with my GoPro on, and I'm talking to my other counterpart, uh, Brent Manny, who's phenomenally smart. He's the other PJ that mainly does the medical stuff uh, that was working with me, and he was like, you know, we we're talking about what was right or wrong and he had a lot of experience with orion and i was trying to bridge my gap my, my experience with spacex and we're talking about all this stuff and uh and i have this other uh incredibly smart diver that's is standing there kind of trying to test the buoyancy on it like kind of jumping up and down a little bit on it, a guy named tim goddard and mike geyer this diver was right in the middle where the two parts came together and was just sitting there kind of looking up at us listening to this conversation of these two jackasses going back and forth and all of a sudden man that thing pops <laughs> just oh, wax him Damn. i mean literally i thought i mean i thought it was you know going to knock him unconscious and um it, it it probably gave him a little bit of a tbi but came up with a big old gash on his head and, and but instead of like my gut instinct was not like oh let's check on this guy i just started laughing <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm sure you appreciate. So it, it, when you watch the video, you, yeah. you'll see actually, see you're that, like, yeah. oh my gosh, man, this is freaking wild. So uh, just just stupid stuff like that. Oh, uh, yeah, actually, close call. It's it's not uh, the scariest thing I've ever done in my whole life, man. I've been shot at, you know, million times overseas, crazy stuff, blown up, you name it, overseas. But the scariest thing I've ever encountered was being 20 miles off the coast on a jet ski with no lights on and not sure where the the shore was oh, in wow. confused seas. Damn. So we were out doing some testing that went long and I had to ride this jet ski in. And so I'm literally, again, 20 miles off, maybe, you know, f four to five foot seas, but they're confused. And so, and when you have no lights, you don't know which way you're getting hit from. You see some dim lights in the, in, in the distance that you know is like, well, that's the direction I should be going, but you're just getting knocked back and forth. And you're like, man, if I yeah. freaking fall off this damn thing, yeah. I am toast. And so I was just like yelling the whole way and like, ah, I don't know what that was doing, but I was just yelling as I was hitting all these. So it was like the scariest thing. I remember my heart racing thinking like, is this really how I'm going to go, man? Yeah. Is, You're completely by yourself. Well, it wasn't supposed to be. So there was uh, there was a, a boat that was out there too, but they couldn't see me. And they, and, and they were just, uh, and, and, you know, I may have had like a strobe on the back of my helmet or something, but man, they were, they were moving and I was just trying to find them and stay with them and go in this general area. But I mean, I promise you if I had fallen off, they wouldn't yeah, have found me. Yeah. So yeah, they, I, w I was not supposed to be on my own and this yeah. was not supposed to happen. We were not supposed to be, uh, we weren't supposed to go into the, you know, night hours Henceforth, uh, my company now, all of our jet skis have freaking inflation collars and lights, yeah. big ass lights and beacons and wow. you name it. Like, I mean, you learn from stuff like that, but I'm like, damn, dude, that was yeah. freaking scary. It's funny because most people wouldn't think that would be scary, oh, but when you're terrible. in that position, it is absolutely terrifying. Well, and 20 miles in those kind of conditions, that must have taken you hours to get back. Right? It was I mean. at least an hour and a half. And uh, the, last, uh, the last like two miles of it, 
the whole way my uh, low fuel light or my low fuel beacon was just, yeah. you know, the whole time <laughs> trying to shut it off. But you're, but luckily I was yelling, so I couldn't really yeah. hear it. And I was scared. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that's, that's some dicey shit. No doubt about it. Um, the entire time that you, that you were there, uh, was there ever any mention uh, of aliens or anything extraterrestrial that way? Like, did you guys ever even? No, never nothing? really messed with the whole alien thing. With the, this last jump we did with uh, it, it in Roswell, there was uh, I've met some interesting cats that have some opinions on stuff like that. But no, yeah. no, no mention of aliens yeah. or extraterrestrial life. And I, I can tell you, you know, for those flat earthers or those folks that think we didn't land on the moon, like I've seen evidence of like in Langley, Virginia, I was telling you where we're doing that pool flip. They literally have all of the stuff where they were practicing the moon landing and yeah. they had all the original uh, stuff where they would actually come down and whatever the Eagle yeah. <laughs> and like fly down. And they, yeah. So I got to like open old crusty old blew the dust off file cabinets and looking through all this historic stuff. So, I mean, all that stuff really happened. And yeah, that's cool. I happen to believe and probably in good company here that our government is way too unorganized yeah. to keep something like that secret. So, uh, no, I, I agree. I mean, I, I've had arguments, arguments, whatever I've had comments or discussions, uh, you know, mostly with people, you know, in the comment section, which I, I typically steer away from, but I, We'll check once in a while, and there's a lot of you know, 9-11 deniers and uh, flat earthers, and we didn't land on the moon and all, all kinds of stuff. But, uh, I mean, whatever, to each their own. You know, if, that, uh, if that's what keeps you off the ledge every day, then so be it. Yeah, well, I didn't used to be a conspiracy guy. Uh, COVID has changed my mind on that. Now I'm starting to go back and think about a lot of stuff. And I'm like, well, I know we couldn't keep a secret like the moon landing, yeah. right? Or, yeah. you know, uh, the 9-11 thing is still, <laughs> when you watch it, you're like, damn, there's actually some good evidence for, like, some of this stuff, you know? But at the end of the day, you're like, well... Yeah, I, I seriously doubt that we would do that to our own people. Like, yeah, so I hope not. I, yeah, I mean that's a that's a whole whole other conversation, I guess. But in the carnage we were seeing, like I said, man, every day it was at least a double amputee, and we had like fifteen like gunshot wounds to the chest. I mean, guys dying on you left and right, terrible stuff. In my brain, there's no way this guy lived. 